I'm Nima Rajan. With a federal election forecast for the near future, the leaders of the opposition parties have already been pounding the pavement. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh and conservative leader Erin O'Toole have been traveling from province to province to sell their promise of a better Canada under their leadership. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has also been jetting across the country, contributing his own flurry of funding announcements. China's ambassador to Canada insists his country's decision or detention of two Canadians is not related to Canada's arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou. Still, Chiang Pai Wu says Ms. Meng's arrest at the behest of the United States remains the main obstacle to good relations between the two countries. Canadians Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig were detained in China almost three years ago in apparent retaliation for Canada's arrest of Ms. Meng. Mr. Spavor has now been sentenced to 11 years in prison for alleged spying. The government may not be ready to welcome Admiral Art MacDonald back as commander of the Canadian Armed Forces. Military police opted not to charge Admiral MacDonald after completing a nearly six-month investigation into allegations of misconduct. Yesterday, his legal team said he's been exonerated and would be returning as chief of the defense staff. But Defense Minister Harjit Sajjan says there still has to be a government review of the situation. Fully vaccinated Canadians will soon be able to get a government document that certifies their COVID-19 vaccine history for the purpose of international travel. Intergovernmental Affairs Minister Dominic LeBlanc says putting the passports together will involve the provinces and territories handing over information about people who have been vaccinated. The document will include data on the type of vaccines received, the dates and the location. Minister LeBlanc says the information will be secure. Canada's Airline Association is giving a big thumbs up to Ottawa's plan to have vaccine passports implemented for international travel. The president of the National Airlines Council of Canada says a standardized digital certification of vaccine status is critical to restart the country's travel and tourism sectors. Mike McNanny adds that he hopes all governments will work together to ensure a planned fall release date for vaccine passports will be met. There has been widespread debate over whether COVID-19 booster shots will be broadly needed. But new research from the University Health Network in Toronto suggests a third dose of a COVID-19 vaccine could help better protect organ transplant patients. The study's joint senior author, Dr. Deepali Kumar, says some transplant patients are completely unprotected with two doses and should be offered a third. Officials in B.C. say health and emergency services are standing ready ahead of another scorching heat wave this week. Various measures are being set up, including cooling centers, which will offer targeted support to vulnerable people. At the end of June, the province was trapped under a similar heat dome, and as many as 600 people died of heat-related illnesses. Alberta experienced its largest single-day increase of COVID-19 cases yesterday since late May. Officials say the province tallied 501 new infections, bumping the active case count to 3,769. The province's top doctor notes the majority of Albertans facing severe outcomes are either unvaccinated or partially vaccinated. The Winnipeg Jets will require all fans to be fully vaccinated to attend home games. The Jets' parent company, True North Sports and Entertainment, says season ticket holders made it clear that is their preference. The company says it plans to fill the arena for Jets' home games and will require all employees, event staff and guests to provide proof and of vaccination. Masks will also be required. Ontario's COVID-19 health measures have been updated. Perhaps the biggest change is for residents who have two doses of vaccine, as they will not have to isolate now if they are a close contact of someone who tests positive. That is unless they develop symptoms or public health tells them to do so. Unvaccinated high-risk contacts will need to isolate for 10 days and take a COVID test seven days into their isolation. Household members of close contacts will also have to abide by similar rules. The federal government is providing $20 million to help fixed gear fisheries in Atlantic Canada and Quebec to convert to whale-safe gear by the beginning of the 2023 fishing seasons. The new gear requirements, such as weak breaking points and weaker rope, are intended to make it easier for large whales to free themselves from fishing gear. The funding will be available over the next two years. 
All right, stay with us. Canadian businessman Michael Spavor's jail sentence of 11 years yesterday in China is raising concerns across the country. We speak with a China relations expert on what Canada needs to do right now to return the two Michaels. An interview with Dr. Charles Burton, senior fellow at the Macdonald Laurier Institute, coming up after the break. That and, of course, more news from around the world on the Forum Daily. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Canadian businessman Michael Spavor has been sentenced to 11 years in prison in a spying case that has been linked to Beijing's pressure campaign against the Canadian government. Mr. Spavor and former Canadian diplomat Michael Kovrig were detained soon after Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou was arrested in 2018 at the Vancouver airport. The Chinese government denies a direct connection to the two Michaels' detentions. This is not the only issue between Canada and China, as trade disputes, espionage allegations and human rights issues are also affecting the relationship. Joining us now to unpack the situation is Dr. Charles Burton, a China expert and senior fellow at the Macdonald Laurier Institute. Institute. Doctor, welcome back to Forum Daily. Thank you very much. It's good to speak with you again. So let's start with the 11-year sentence for Michael Spavor. Did you expect this ruling and what does this indicate for Michael Kovrig's situation? Well, uh, you know, 11 years is about right for this kind of um, crime of foreigners who are alleged to have committed espionage in China. You know, a previous case of the Canadian Kevin Garrett back in 20. Uh, 17 uh, was an eight-year sentence, and like Mr. Spaver, he'd also done absolutely nothing that, that was actually espionage. So anyway, that seems to be the norm. I think with the case of, uh, of Michael Kovrig, I expect that the sentence will be higher because um, the Chinese government's narrative is that Mr. Kovrig was a spy master and he was getting um, state secrets from uh, Mr. Svaver, who was his subordinate. So, you know, one presumes that, that Kovrig will get a, a stronger sentence. The question is, how, how much of a sentence will he get? If it was a death sentence, I think we'd have really a lot to worry about. But, you know, giving out a sentence like this simply allows the, the possibility for their deportation, because once the case is settled, um, which, it, which in the case of Mr. Svaver now is, uh, under, under Chinese practice, they could deport him at any time. Now, the case of the two Michaels has definitely highlighted tensions between Canada and China. But as we mentioned, there are multiple tensions between the two countries. So what are some of the other major issues we can examine here? Well, I think largely Chinese retaliation for um, Meng Wanzhou. So not just the hostage diplomacy, but we've seen economic coercion through the imposition of non-tariff barriers onto Canadian uh, agricultural commodity exports to China, which you know were utterly unjustified, but did considerable damage to our prairie farmers who had to seek markets elsewhere, uh, and also meat producers in Quebec. But, you know, we have a wide range of, of issues with China, particularly cyber espionage, uh, Chinese um, influence operations inside Canada attempting to corrupt Canadian policymakers, harassment of, um, of people in China who oppose the regime, particularly Canadians of Uyghur and Tibetan origin, and uh, China's um, domestic and international human rights uh, including the um, genocidal policies towards Turkic Muslims in the Northwest, uh, China's betrayal of its commitment to maintain freedoms in Hong Kong, uh, China's um, expansion of military bases onto reclaimed islands in the South China Sea, and it just goes on and on and on. Um, so, you know, there's certainly a need for Canada in concert with the United States and our like-minded um, allies to try and engage in some concerted retaliation against China to try and give that country incentive to get back into compliance with the norms of diplomacy and trade and the international rules-based order. This is really a matter of great urgency in terms of the geostrategic future of, of, of the globe, both economically and in terms of security. Just over a minute left, Doctor, but what kind of steps do you think the Canadian government should take in order to bring these Michaels back home? Well, you know, we have been trying to work with the United States to get a deferred prosecution agreement that would allow Ms. Meng to return to, to uh, China if 
her company Huawei paid a big fine and she acknowledged culpability. I, I think ultimately we really have to crack down on the Chinese uh, diplomatic activities. And my suggestion would be that we reduce our representation uh, in China to the charge d'affaires level, expel the Chinese ambassador, and uh, use that as the basis of negotiation for the return of our two innocent Canadians who have been subjected to Chinese prison hell for almost a thousand days now. All right, Dr. Burton, always great having you on Forum Daily, sir. Thank you again for giving us your time today. It's good to speak with you. Stay tuned. Up next, Interac measures the sound of spending with their latest initiative. We speak with Matt Hewton, the Director of Digital and Integrated Marketing at Interac. Up next, that and of course more news from around the world only on Forum Daily. So stay tuned. We'll be right back after these short messages from our sponsors. As Canadians slowly return to their normal pre-pandemic activities, retailers hope for a return to normal shopping habits after a pandemic that saw thousands of small businesses shut down. This week, Interact launched a new technology that tracked national shopping trends throughout the pandemic, such as debit spending on food, home, entertainment, and more, all while using sound waves. This information was mapped using musical instruments, which tracked spending habits of Canadians over time. Joining us now to tell us more about the sound of spending is Matt Hewton, the Director of Digital and Integrated Marketing at Interact. Sir, welcome back to Forum Daily. Hi, thank you for having me. So can you give us an overview on the Sound of Spending program and how it works? Absolutely. So we had an idea to take the transactional data that Interact has very unique access to and look at how our lives have been shaped and affected through the lens of spending during the pandemic. And we were really seeing these interesting patterns, peaks and valley, how people were spending money at various stages going back to early 2019 present. And there was an idea of you know, commerce and finance being very transactional and really missing an emotion, missing a feeling. Yet music is so universal and emotional that we had the idea of mapping these transactional data points to music. And then the possibility occurred to create a digital tool that allows us to do that and then ultimately create a song that was really telling the story of how Canadians spent their money and their lives through the lens of spending during the pandemic in Canada. Now, that's some uh, really interesting information, sir. Really a unique technology being used here. How did the idea of tracking consumer habits with sound waves come about? Well, in uh, spring of this year, Interact launched a new brand platform, which is called In Life. And it's all about the principle that when you are in control of your money by using our products and services, which are debit, using your own money, not credit, you get more out of life. You get this confidence and, and good feeling and empowerment to make the choices you want to make and live the life you want to lead. So there's a bit more of an emotional story that we're trying to tell in association with using our products and services. And really, there's nothing more relatable and emotionally driven than music. You know, it can tell the story of our lives. Everybody likes music. Everyone has their favorite types of music. And it's just a universal feeling, a universal phenomenon. So it was really the idea of converting data, which is really a not very emotional thing, uh, into something that would become very relatable and emotional for people. And we were fortunate to work with great partners through our creative ad agency and build this tool together to make something truly unique for Canadians to hear. Just a little over two minutes left, sir, but let's get into the research now. So uh, what are some of the key takeaways from the most recent results of the Sound of Spending program? Well, I think there's a lot to be encouraged by and to feel confident about. And, and that's certainly making us feel good at Interact as a reflection of Canadian spending. Um, we're seeing uh, spending starting to rise in key categories like travel, like restaurant and shopping by 35% in recent months. And, you know, as, as you can understand and appreciate at the start of the pandemic with everything locking down, uh, spending around restaurants uh, completely stopped because they were closed. Spending on groceries rose by 15% because people were rushing out and hoarding toilet paper and stocking up on things they might not normally buy. And then, you know, spending declined and went up and down in peaks and valleys as we went in and out of different lockdown states in Canada. But now as we're moving into, you know, a more vaccinated state and things are opening up more, we're seeing these very promising trends that uh, the economy is heading in a positive direction. 
Just about a minute and 30 seconds left, sir. But is there anything that retailers in particular can learn from this research in their efforts to build back their businesses post-pandemic? Well, you know, one thing we've done is we commissioned a survey of uh, 150 financial decision makers across retail. And we learned that they really want to spend less time on the transaction itself. So I think as Interac, um, you know, we're here to help retailers with efficient ways of using our products, making it easy and seamless for customers. I think as people really start to transition from more online shopping to a balance of online with in-store, you know, we're, we're really excited to be part of that solution with what we can do for, for businesses. All right, sir, just about 45 seconds left, but can individual Canadians help to add to this research or maybe identify their own personal shopping habits? Well, the really cool part is we created a song that tells the story of Canadian spending, but you can make your own. So you can go to interact.ca slash sound of spending, and you can use a personal tool to do some inputs around how you budget your money, and you'll get your own customized song that will be completely unique to you. So I think, you know, that's really the coolest part of the whole execution is being able to personalize it. All right, Mr. Hewton, always great having you on Forum Daily. Thank you again for your time today, sir. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. We've got top headlines from around the world coming up after the break as the U.S. president stays true to his decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan. Meanwhile, the Taliban takes over its 10th provincial capital in Afghanistan and Poland's parliament passes a new media bill. These stories and more news from around the world coming up next on the Forum Daily. Afghan government forces are collapsing even faster than predicted in the worst-case scenario by U.S. military leaders. It is likely too late for the United States to stop the route, and there's little appetite at the White House or the Pentagon to even try to do so. Mr. Biden has made clear he has no intention of stopping the U.S. withdrawal, and the military is not pressing him to change his mind. Meanwhile, two Afghan officials and the Taliban say the militants have seized the provincial capital of Ghazni. The Thursday capture marks the 10th provincial capital to be seized by the insurgents in the last week. Sporadic fighting continued on Thursday. However, officials say the Taliban raised their flag and the city had calmed after hours of heavy fighting. Lebanon's caretaker prime minister on Thursday called a decision by the central bank to end subsidies to fuel products illegal. He called for an emergency cabinet meeting to discuss the move. The Wednesday night announcement by the central bank is likely to send prices soaring. Lebanon is in the midst of an unprecedented economic crisis. The move was expected, but on Thursday, politicians distanced themselves and blamed central bank governor Riyad Salamay. Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis says recent wildfires amount to the greatest ecological catastrophe Greece has seen in decades. The fires broke out during the most intense heat wave experienced in 30 years. Hundreds of wildfires broke out across the country, stretching Greece's firefighting capabilities to the limit and leading the government to appeal for help from abroad. Hundreds of firefighters, along with planes, helicopters and other vehicles, arrived from European and Middle Eastern countries to assist. Poland's parliament has voted in favor of a controversial bill on media regulation. It has been viewed as a blow to media independence in Poland. The bill still needs presidential approval. The draft legislation would prevent non-European owners from having controlling stakes in Polish media companies. In practice, it only affects TVN, including a dedicated new station that is critical of the government. The Venezuelan government and opposition are set to start their third effort at talks in four years. Mexico will host the round of discussions starting Friday. The discussions this time are surrounded by very low expectations from analysts and even apathy from citizens of the troubled South American nation. The opposition has weakened and fractured since the last round of talks took place in 2019. A day before he is released on parole, Samsung heir Lee Jae-yong has appeared in a South Korean court for another trial. Mr. Lee is among some 800 prisoners being released before a national holiday. Mr. Lee had a year left on a 30-month sentence for embezzling corporate funds to bribe South Korea's previous president. He was separately charged with financial crimes related to a 2015 merger between two Samsung affiliates. Mr. Lee's lawyers say he is a victim of presidential abuse of power and the 2015 deal was part of normal business activity. Official figures show the British economy grew by 4.8% in the second quarter of 2021 as lockdown restrictions were lifted. 
The Office for National Statistics also says the economy grew by 1% in June alone, which was the fifth straight month of growth. The lifting of pandemic restrictions following the rapid rollout of vaccines in the UK has sustained growth in recent months. Economists expect further growth in the months to come. New Zealand plans to begin a cautious reopening of its borders to international travellers early next year. Government officials also said on Thursday they would delay second shots of the Pfizer vaccine in order to speed up first shots and protect more people as the threat of the Delta variant grows. New Zealand has managed to completely stamp out the coronavirus, allowing life to return almost to normal. The nation of 5 million people has reported just 26 deaths since the pandemic has begun. A new law requiring food delivery companies in Spain to hire delivery riders and drivers as employees rather than freelance contractors has gone into effect. Spain's trade union confederation said the so-called riders law that entered into force on Thursday would put an end to the labor fraud that workers in the sector have suffered for too long. But it said the labor ministry and inspectors should ensure compliance through monitoring, evaluation and reporting. Companies say the law threatens a 700 million euro industry in Spain. UK artist Annie Nicholson is hitting the road in an ice cream van to serve some delicious scoops and spark conversations about mental health during COVID-19. Since her family members passed away in 2011, Miss Nicholson has channeled her creativity to help cope. With most of her works featured in galleries, she decided to take to the streets to spread her uplifting messages using an ice cream van that doubles as a safe therapeutic space. Visitors can pop in for a quick chat or they can sign up for a variety of talks and workshops as well, all while enjoying a free scoop of ice cream. I'm Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at national and international news for today. Remember, for more news on demand, you could always visit our website or follow us on social media. Take care, Canada. We'll see you next time.